Right now on Morning News Now, NBC News goes one-on-one -on -one with Vice President Kamala Harris. Are the last four years an obstacle to you in this race? Here's how I look at it. First of all, let me be very clear. Mine will not be a continuation of the Biden administration. I bring my own experiences, my own ideas to it. With less than two weeks until Election Day, the Democratic hopeful opens up about where she stands on key issues as Americans prepare to cast their votes, what she told our Hallie Jackson about her plans for everything from the economy to abortion. And the scathing new criticism of former President Donald Trump from his own former chief of staff, John Kelly. Plus, push for peace. Secretary of State Blinken urging Israel to end the war in Gaza, saying that not enough is being done to end the humanitarian crisis in the war-torn region. We're on the ground in Beirut as Israel expands its airstrikes in Lebanon. Also this morning, the former CEO of Abercrombie & Fitch arrested and charged with sex trafficking. According to the federal indictment, Mike Jeffries, along with an employee and his romantic partner, allegedly lured men to attend sex events with the promise of coveted modeling contracts. And talking taxes, the IRS announced new federal income tax brackets for 2025. And that could have a big impact on your bottom line. We're breaking down what you need to know right now. Good morning. I'm Christine Romans. Joe and Savannah are on assignment. We begin our show this morning with our build up to Election Day, now just under two weeks away. As the race for the White House heats up, Vice President Kamala Harris says her team is considering the possibility that former President Donald Trump could try to claim victory prematurely on election night. Harris made the comments to NBC's Hallie Jackson in a one-on-one -on -one interview yesterday. During the, the wide-ranging conversation, Harris talked about her plans for the economy and also said America was ready for a female president of color. Here's Hallie with more on that interview. Hey there, we had a chance to spend some time with Vice President Harris on the campaign trail as she was out in battlegrounds Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And we also sat down with her at the Naval Observatory here in Washington, D.C., covering a wide range of topics in this race. Everything from the economy to abortion rights to the gender gap to former President Trump. Thank you, Madam Vice President, for your time today. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. For so many voters, we know that a huge issue for them is the economy. Right. It's the cost of living. Our new NBC News poll shows that more voters think that the Biden administration policies have hurt them rather than helped them. And I wonder, are the last four years an obstacle to you in this race? Here's how I look at it. First of all, let me be very clear. Mine will not be a continuation of the Biden administration. I bring my own experiences, my own ideas to it. And it has informed a number of my areas of focus, most of which are on, to your point, lowering costs. So part of my plan includes what we need to do to bring down the price of groceries, including the work I will do dealing with price gouging, something I dealt with when I was attorney general, something I will deal with going forward. Then why do you think that's not landing with voters? Because oh, in I the numbers, it it's the opposite. Former President Trump leads you on this issue. Well, when I'm out, this is why I'm going out to Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and, and, um, and, and Michigan, and Michigan yeah. excuse me, just got in late this morning, actually, um, but going to three states yesterday, and I'm going to continue being on the road. I have to earn the, the vote. As you sit here today, do you think the country is ready now for a woman and a woman of color to be president? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And I am saying that in terms of every walk of life of our country. You know, I think part of what is important in this election is really not only turning the page, but closing the page and the chapter on an era that suggests that Americans um, are divided. The vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. And what the American people want in their president is a president for all Americans, which is the type and kind of president I pledge to be. You've been reluctant to lean into, to talk about the historic nature of your candidacy on the campaign trail. Why is that? Well, I'm clearly a woman. <laughs> I don't need to point that out to anyone. Uh, the, the point that most people really care about is can you do the job and do you have a plan to actually focus on them? There is a big gender gap in this race. Fewer men support you right now than they did President Biden. Some of your allies have suggested there's sexism at play. I wonder, do you think there is sexism at play here? Let me just tell you something. You've come to my events and you will see there are men and women at those events. So the experience that I am having is one in which it is clear that regardless of someone's gender, they want to know that their president has a plan to lower cost, that their president has a plan to secure America in the context of our position around the world. Do you not see sexism as a factor in this race at all? 
I don't think of it that way. My challenge is the challenge of making sure I can talk with and listen to as many voters as possible and earn their vote. We traveled with the vice president to campaign events in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. We are out here chatting with Vice President Kamala Harris, and she is looking to win over moderate voters, Republicans, undecided in this key battleground state. We're off to the next one. Wisconsin is next. Including events with former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney. You're out here trying to reach women, trying to reach moderate Republicans. We are just two weeks out from the election. Yes. If they're still undecided, it means something about your message hasn't connected with them yet. What is it? We're two weeks away from a presidential election, and people are listening to the issues. You could tell from the response here with a group of undecideds, many independents, many Republicans, that they are open to and actually supportive of an approach that is about saying that we must have a president of the United States who honors and defends the Constitution of the United States as opposed to Donald Trump that says he wants to terminate it. And on the campaign trail, she criticized former President Trump on minimum wage after he avoided saying whether it should be raised while campaigning at a McDonald's. Do you have a number? What would you like to see it at? Well, at least $15 an hour, but we'll work with Congress, right? That, that's something that is going through Congress. And we also asked her about Trump supporter billionaire Elon Musk campaigning in Pennsylvania with his $1 million offer to a random registered voter if they've signed his petition in favor of free speech and the right to bear arms. Do you worry that it could be effective, his support for former President Trump in that key battleground? Listen, I'm not about doing it, gimmicks and all of that. I think that what we have to do and what I'm going to continue to do is to be out in communities. We also asked about abortion rights if Congress were to be controlled by Republicans. So is a question of pragmatism then what concessions would be on the table? Religious exemptions, for example, is that something that you would consider? I don't think we should be Congress? making concessions when we're talking about a fundamental freedom to make decisions about your own body. We are sitting here two weeks away from election night. Last election, mm -hmm. the former president came out on election night and declared victory before all the votes were counted. What is your plan if he does that again in two weeks? Well, let me say this. We've got two weeks to go. And I'm very much grounded in the present in terms of the task at hand. And we will deal with election night and the days after as they come. And we have the resources and the expertise and the, and, and the focus on that as well. So you Mine? have teams ready to go? Is that what you're saying? Are you thinking about that as a possibility? Of course. This is a person, Donald Trump, who tried to undo the, a free and fair election, who still denies the will of the people, who incited a violent mob to attack the United States Capitol and 140 law enforcement officers were attacked. Would you consider, if you win and he's convicted, a pardon for former President Trump? I'm not going to get into those hypotheticals. I'm focused on the next 14 days. But do you believe, is there any part of you that subscribes to the argument that has been made in the past, that a pardon could help bring America together, could help unify the country and move, them, move on? Let me tell you what's going to help us move on. I get elected president of the United States. And later in the week, the vice president will be heading to Texas, not a traditional presidential battleground, but her campaign's aiming to spotlight the state's restrictive abortion law as part of their push to mobilize voters on that issue. Back to you. All right, Hallie, thanks so much. For a closer look at the 2024 race, let's bring in NBC News senior national politics reporter John Allen and White House correspondent Monica Alba. Uh, good morning to both of you. Monica, we just, we just heard at the end of that piece about how VP Harris is focused on the next 14 days, but does that mean that behind the scenes there's no planning going on for all the different kinds of scenarios that pop up after the election? What's, what's being put into place? They definitely are preparing, Christine, for the various different scenarios, and we know that according to several sources who are familiar with the Harris campaign strategy. They're bracing for the possibility uh, of really several things. The fact that it could take days to declare a winner, the fact that it is possible former President Trump could do what he did four years ago, which is come out and declare victory before everything is tallied. And of course, Harris herself is a trained attorney. This is somebody who's very familiar with legal challenges and the courts overall. So she has directed her teams, her team of lawyers to be prepared and to really, again, be kind of bracing for this idea that we came to know a few years ago of not just an election night, but an election week, possibly. Now, again, it could change and things could be known far sooner within hours, potentially, and not days, but just on the off chance that that happens and the likelihood, given what we saw four years ago, they're certainly ready for 
for that. But as you saw there, the vice president publicly, at least on the campaign trail, isn't really going to be talking about those different scenarios, I'm told. Instead, she is going to focus on this get out the vote final push before that. But once that comes, they say they will be ready. You know, John, speaking to The New York Times, former White House uh, Chief of Staff John Kelly said he believes that if elected, uh, Donald Trump would rule like a dictator. The Times writing, quote, uh, Kelly said Trump met the definition of a fascist. Let's listen to some of that. If he was left to his own devices, would he be a dictator if he didn't have people around him? Oh, I think he'd, you know, I think he'd love to be. Uh, I, I think he'd love to be just like he was in business. He could tell people to do things and they would do it. And, uh, and not really bother too much about whether, uh, what the legalities were and whatnot. But again, I, I didn't know him before, so I can't believe. At the same time, The Atlantic published a news story citing two sources who claimed Trump once said in private conversation, quote, I need the kind of generals that Hitler had. Uh, Trump's spokesperson pushing back on all of this, saying that he, he never made those Hitler comments and adding, quote, John Kelly has totally uh, beclowned himself with these debunked stories. John, this isn't a new characterization of Trump. So does this do any damage with less than two weeks to go? You're right. It's not a, a new characterization of Trump. And actually, that particular quote, uh, not that it shouldn't have the same resonance years later, it was actually in a book uh, by Peter Baker and Susan Glasser uh, that came out a couple of years ago about Trump. But the underlying question of whether it changes any votes, I think the answer is no. Um, I, you know, there's no new information, at least there has not been new information uh, in this election that seems to have uh, dented Donald Trump's uh, level of popularity with his supporters. Um, you know, as he once said, Famously, in the 2016 campaign, he felt like he could walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot people and uh, not lose any votes. I think that uh, that there's some truth to that. Um, and so uh, the question now is whether uh, Kamala Harris, is, Vice President Harris, is going to be able to uh, get to a point where uh, she has the trust of more voters than he does. Monica, the candidates are trying to pick off any last disaffected voters that they can find. I'm thinking about those people who refused to vote for President Biden during the primaries over his support for Israel. In her interview with Halley, uh, Kamala Harris shied away from really differentiating herself from the current administration. Uh, why not take that opportunity? Yeah, and she's had several of those opportunities over the last couple of weeks. Certainly, she has debuted that newer line about how she promises her hypothetical administration wouldn't be a continuation of the Biden presidency. But we know that his record is a drag on her candidacy. So there is this awareness and push for her to differentiate. She did try there to lean in on some of those maybe economic proposals that we could hear a little bit more about in this closing stretch and about acknowledging that inflation is still uh, for some people in terms of the cost of living, it feels too high at the grocery store or at the gas pump and this idea of trying to put forward proposals on affordable housing. So she's trying to say that there are things that their own Biden-Harris administration maybe did to get the economy to where it is in a place where it certainly has recovered compared to four years ago, but that she would want to do more. Again, this is somebody, though, who has been so unflinchingly loyal to the president that she doesn't want to really go beyond that, according to my reporting. So she needs to kind of walk that fine line. And that's what we keep see, seeing her do. And it'll be notable if she takes it any further. Christine. Hey, John, the voting is underway. It's two weeks to the election, but people are voting now. And when you look at the numbers of early votes being cast, more than 21 million in just a few days, according to Target Smart, how do you think both sides, John, are feeling about these early numbers? After the election, Christine, we'll all look back and say, wow, we saw the deeds of what was going on in, these, in this early voting, but it's actually very difficult to tell, uh, to project. Um, you know, I've been uh, talking, of course, to a lot of Republican sources because I'm covering uh, the Trump campaign. They do feel good that they're uh, that they're banking some of these votes as as it were, the, uh, particularly in Nevada. They've looked at the numbers there. They feel good about that. They feel good about where they are in Georgia and Pennsylvania. Um, uh, there is some debate as to whether people who vote very early in the process or simply people who would have otherwise have voted on election day. Uh, but, but as campaign operatives will tell you, once they bank those votes, it just reduces the universe of uh, voters that they need to go contact and try to get out to the polls. So at least it makes it easier on the campaigns. And uh, again, we'll look back and we'll say, oh, we, saw, we, we should have known. Um, but it, it is a very small percentage of the electorate uh, and certainly not anything that's 
uh, definitive at this point, Christine. All right, well, here we go. Two weeks to go. John Allen and Monica Alba, thank you so much. New York is a historically blue state voting Democratic in the last nine presidential elections. But in the 2022 midterms, Democrats lost five competitive House seats at races in the state, uh, helping Republicans win the majority. Now, with less than two weeks until Election Day, the Empire State could decide who controls Congress. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale has more. I feel like I'm at a... Um pre-mission brief back in uh, <laughs> back in my uh, army days. This is a different kind of mission for freshman congressman and Iraq war veteran Pat Ryan. We won the last time by 1%, 1.3%. The New York Democrat relying on a reproductive freedom focused message to keep his seat in this swing district. It's literally an existential personal issue of freedom. And if you want to piss off the American people, take their freedom away. His opponent, Allison Esposito, a former cop. Campaign doesn't stop with the rain. <laughs> hoping to overtake him by highlighting GOP hot button issues. It's crime, public safety, law and order, the economy, the border crisis, uh, the attack on, on our kids' education. As far as abortion, my opponent want to make, wants to make this entire election about abortion. And it's, it's not even a factor in this race. What would you like to see fixed first? I would like to see uh, a timeline on abortion. See, but that's funny. Like, we were saying abortion doesn't come up. He so cares. So funny. New York's 18th congressional district is one of seven seats here that could decide who controls Congress. <laughs> In 2022, Democrats lost five competitive House races in this blue state, helping Republicans win the majority, including the 17th district, where Republican Mike Lawler bested the head of the House Democratic campaign arm and is now hoping to keep this swing seat red and hold the majority. Do you guys still deserve it after the last two years? Yeah, I, I think, look. It's been pretty chaotic. Sure, but, you know, at the end of the day, name me one thing Chuck Schumer and Senate Democrats have accomplished. Not yeah, much. Former Congressman Mondaire Jones, who's challenging Lawler, disagrees. What's your unfinished business in Congress? I'm really proud of the work that I started last term as part of a Congress that was actually pro-choice and pro-democracy and committed to actually delivering for my constituents here in the 17th Congressional District. In these Hudson Valley races, a swirl of local issues, housing, affordability, and cleaning up the Hudson River mixed with national flashpoints on immigration, abortion rights, and the economy. A controversial New Yorker on the ballot. We're going to win New York. And a traditionally blue state plagued by bad press for big New York Democratic names only adds to the complex landscape. The statewide Democratic brand here, I think, is pretty toxic. But is Trump's brand better? It's not a function of whose brand is better. I mean, frankly, uh, you look at Kathy Hochul and Eric Adams, they're a train wreck. I was among the first people to call for him to resign. Look, I'm like Mike Lawler, who never stands up to Donald Trump or anyone else in his party. Competing messages flooding the airwaves, thanks to more than 42 million spent in just these two seats alone. Both incumbents trying to tune out the partisan noise and focus on the moderate middle. There's a reason both Joe Biden and Donald Trump have praised me. It's because I am willing to work across the aisle. What coalition are you trying to build when you talk about having a bipartisan bill with Mike Lawler and also AOC is campaigning here with you? I'm trying to get shit done. Like, <laughs> seriously. Seriously close races, hinging House control on New York voters' state of mind. Thank you, Allie, for that report. Uh, the deadline to register to vote here in New York is this Saturday, October 26th. Early voting begins that same day and runs through November 3rd. Turning now to overseas news where U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem yesterday. Blinken spent the meeting urging Israel to focus on securing the release of hostages and ending the war in Gaza. This, as Israel announced, it had also killed Hezbollah's presumed leadership successor, in a Beirut airstrike earlier this month. For more, let's bring in NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley, who joins us now from Beirut. And good morning, Matt. We know the U.S. has been putting pressure on Israel to agree to a truce that would end violence in both Gaza and where you are in Lebanon. Do we know if Israel is any closer after yesterday's meeting? No, I mean, obviously, you know, you're seeing a little bit of an effort from the administration. This is an unfailing effort by the administration. They have been sticking to this, trying to get to a ceasefire, trying to create some modicum of peace over the border between where I am here in Lebanon and Israel. And they've been faithfully sticking to this effort for the past year, ever since the last time we saw some kind of truce back in November. But the fact is, this is Anthony Blinken's 11th trip to the Middle East in a little more than a year. He has come back empty handed. 
it almost every time. And despite the fact that Yehia Sinwar was just killed, uh, and he is considered, of course, to be a hardliner, and the administration had said repeatedly that he alone is the one who's holding up a deal, we have to remember that the Israelis have been holding up this deal as well. Uh, and so they've been holding up a deal as well when it comes to steep ceasing the fighting over the border with Lebanon. So that has not changed. And even though the administration is still trying their best time and time again to try to stop the fighting, to try to uh, release the remaining hostages in the Gaza Strip, there has been no indication over the last 24 hours, ever since Anthony Blinken set down wheels here in the Middle East, that there is any progress further toward a deal. Matt, what brings you to that location in Lebanon today? Yeah, well, actually, we're here, I can tell you, shooting a different story and one that is really topical uh, about what's going on here. Uh, this is one of the main hospitals here in Beirut, but not just that. This is also a place where there's the only burn unit in all of Lebanon. Uh, so while we are seeing, you know, patients treated for burns, and they have to be treated for burns in hospitals all over the country, because we've now seen nearly 12,000 people injured in a year of fighting here in Lebanon, this is a crucial place, because only the most important, only the most critical cases of burns come here. Uh, and so we're shooting this for, also for a News Now documentary. Uh, we just saw a very, very small baby uh, who we had met with yesterday, who had burns over about 40% of her body. She just went through surgery. We just saw her again a moment ago. It was a successful surgery. Obviously, she looks like she's in terrible condition. She's covered uh, in skin grafts uh, and bandages. But uh, this was a successful surgery, and the doctors here are really, despite they won't say it, they are working miracles. Wow. Well, we can't wait to see that. And that's amazing work that you're doing there, telling those stories. Another issue on the agenda between the, the secretary and the prime minister uh, was Israel's blocking of, of aid, humanitarian aid, into Gaza. It seems like some aid is getting in, but not enough uh, to please the United States. What, what do we know if any, if any progress was made on that front? Well, in terms of progress on that front, we know that Anthony Blinken delivered the message. He told this, and actually this comes about a week after we understand that there was a letter, and, uh, and we hadn't actually seen a lot of verification of this letter, but the Israelis had reported receiving it, that the U.S. administration had given the Israelis a 30-day period in order to improve living circumstances in the Gaza Strip. Otherwise, they would take the very drastic and really unprecedented, well, except for one occasion, almost unprecedented step of withholding military aid to Israel. Uh, we haven't really seen that kind of tough language that much ever since the beginning of these hostilities back in October. But this is a situation in the Gaza Strip that is getting worse and worse by the day, even by the standards of the Gaza Strip. We just heard from Philip Lazzarini. He's the head of UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency. That is the UN agency that is mostly in charge of helping the Palestinians, not just in the Gaza Strip, but also in the West Bank. He was describing an, a catastrophic situation, specifically in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, where aid is not getting through. He puts blame squarely on the Israelis for not delivering enough aid. And this was yesterday he was making these comments. He was describing how shelters are overcrowded, how people are sleeping in the toilets of these shelters. This is a situation that the administration has made clear needs to improve. But at the same time, Gaza is a black box, even for the U.S. Uh, the Israelis are continuing their offensive, continuing their bombardments, not just in the northern part of the Strip, but elsewhere. Uh, and so the humanitarian situation is getting Getting worse and worse by the day. So there has not really been any indication that the words from the U.S. administration have caused any improvements on the ground. All right, Matt Bradley in Lebanon. Thank you so much, Matt. Now to that deadly E. coli outbreak in multiple states that's been linked to the fast food giant McDonald's. The CDC investigating at least 49 food poisoning cases, 10 hospitalizations, and one death connected to the popular quarter pounder hamburger. According to the agency, these 10 states have been impacted by the outbreak, with Colorado and Nebraska reporting the most illnesses. The CDC says McDonald's is working with public health officials. In a statement, McDonald's responded saying that while the exact source of the outbreak remains under investigation, it is, quote, may be linked to uh, slivered onions used in the quarter pounder and sourced by a single supplier that serves three distribution centers. Now for a check on our morning news now weather where unseasonably warm conditions continue from Texas to here in the Northeast. NBC meteorologist Angie Lastman tracking the fine temperatures for us. Good morning, Angie. <laughs> oh, so you're a fan, Christine. <laughs> Good morning to you. Yes, we are dealing with uh, summer-like temperatures in a lot of spots across the country. Actually, 85% of the lower 48 dealing with above normal temperatures. And you can see just how high they go. We've got 15 degrees above normal across parts of the southern plains, stretching into the southeast, about 10 degrees above normal. 
possible. And up into the interior northeast, more than 20 degrees above normal for this time of year. We're also going to take a run at more record highs. We've been talking about this for a couple of days now. These temperatures, uh, again, for late October, not typical. We've got places like Lubbock, Amarillo, Tulsa, Fort Smith stretching out into parts of the southeast, including Atlanta, Mobile, and Baton Rouge, all included in the potential to see more record highs as we get through Saturday. So where do the temperatures currently stand? Well, we've got high 70s in Philadelphia. That's one of those spots running about 15 degrees above normal. We've got mid 80s for Memphis, Jackson, Tulsa. We've got low 90s expected from Midland to Dallas as we get through the afternoon hours today. So warm temperatures across a good chunk of the country. And even tomorrow, we're going to watch for a cold front to kind of usher in a little bit of that cooler air across parts of the Northeast. But that doesn't, of course, help folks to cross the middle of the country. 90 degrees in Oklahoma City for tomorrow. Lubbock heads to 90 degrees as well. Upper 80s for Jackson, Kirksville, Minneapolis, all of these spots across the country running uh, way warm for this time of year. But it all comes to an end. We do start to see temperatures getting back to more typical kind of ranges here as we get into the late week and into our weekend. Chicago, you sit into the mid 60s on Friday and then you're back to the 50s and kind of hang out in that high 50s, low 60s range through the weekend. We've got New York City ending up from the mid to upper 60s Friday and Saturday to the upper 50s on Sunday. So that shot of cool air will arrive for folks as we wrap up our weekend. Similar story for Cincinnati as we round out the weekend. 63 degrees is what you'll get. Uh, we'll end up dealing with uh, some cooler air across parts of the Northeast. But in the meantime, we've got a, a fairly rare red flag warning that's up for Connecticut. Now, just to give you some perspective, the Northeast usually talking fire weather in the springtime. Not so much in the fall. We've got really dry. And of course, I just told you warm conditions on top of the breeze across that region. So we'll see any fires that do ignite become uh, e easy to spread fairly quickly. So heads up for that. That'll last through the day today. I mentioned a cold front. We've got a couple of them. Here's the first one that we're going to watch. Now, I just said it's been dry across the Northeast. And unfortunately, we're going to keep that stretch going. New York, Philadelphia, all those locations uh, really are in need of, of a bit of rain, but doesn't look like this front is going to bring us any. Instead, that'll be up into really northern portions of the Northeast. But we will get some of that cooler air that I showed you a little bit ago that'll kind of work in behind it. Then we'll turn our attention to another front that's going to bring a little bit of rain to the upper Midwest. We'll see the potential for some stronger storms with this, mainly focused across Iowa and Missouri, but we could see some hail uh, accompanying that front as it works across that region for tomorrow. Rainfall amounts, not all that impressive, but we'll take what we can get at this point. We've got about a half an inch expected again across those same regions, Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin. Uh, no flooding concerns, but still just a little, a little dose of rain. Now, if only we could get some of that across the northeast. Exactly. Yeah, they need that rain there in the Midwest. They it's do. Been dry there. All right, Angie, nice to see you. You too. We're just getting started on morning news now. Still ahead, we're diving deep uh, with the ocean's gentle giants. How AI is allowing scientists to track some of the world's largest mammals. But first, allegations of sex events and NDAs were digging into the federal charges against former Abercrombie CEO Mike Jeffries. Next. We're back now with the arrest of former Abercrombie & Fitch CEO Mike Jeffries on, on federal sex trafficking and interstate prostitution charges that could put him in prison for life. Jeffries, his romantic partner and one associate are facing one count of sex trafficking and 15 counts of interstate prostitution connected to 15 alleged victims. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more on the three men's arrests. The former CEO of Abercrombie & Fitch, Mike Jeffries, who built the teen clothing brand in part on racy and at times sexually suggestive advertising, stands accused of multiple federal charges for sex trafficking and interstate prostitution. He was using his power, his wealth, and his influence to traffic men for his own sexual pleasure. Similar allegations were made in a 2023 documentary. I didn't feel safe to like say no or I don't feel comfortable with this. I didn't have control. Though it's unclear if they were part of the charges. According to the federal indictment, Jeffries, along with an employee and his romantic partner, employed coercive, fraudulent, and deceptive tactics to get men to attend sex events, both within the U.S. and overseas, including France, Morocco, and St. Bart's, from 2008 to 2015. They spent millions of dollars on a massive infrastructure to support this operation and maintain its secrecy. 
Prosecutors say the men were paid and led to believe they could get modeling deals or career opportunities if they took part in sex acts. Fifteen unidentified victims say they were often given alcohol and drugs, including muscle relaxants called poppers, according to the indictment. Jeffrey's attorney did not respond to NBC's request for comment, but spoke after his client was released on bond by a Florida federal judge. We'll be dealing with these matters in court, not out here. The former CEO stepped down from his role in 2014. The company struggling after a string of scandals. The focus of another documentary, a 2003 lawsuit alleging discrimination. Abercrombie settled and denied wrongdoing. Catalogs with sexually charged content were pulled, along with controversial T-shirts criticized for being racist and sexist. A decade later, Jeffries, once one of the most influential CEOs in the country, now charged with crimes that, if proven, could put him in prison for life. The U.S. attorney says that beyond the 15 victims mentioned in the indictment, there may be dozens more, and he is urging them to contact the FBI. Back to you. All right, Stephanie, thank you. Coming up, it's time for our medical checkup. After the break, we're digging into new research that says exercise could help alleviate one of the common side effects of chemotherapy. We're back in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Let's get to your weekly medical checkup. We're looking at new research that may help women undergoing chemotherapy fight brain fog. Plus, your favorite songs can brighten a bad day, uh, but they could also help you recover from surgery. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now with the details on all that and a little more. Good morning, Dr. Patel. Our first story is about a common side effect for women receiving chemotherapy. They complain of brain fog or chemo brain. Uh, a new study published in the journal Cancer says exercise might be able to help with that. Explain how that works. Yeah, absolutely. Christine, this is really exciting because there are a majority of women who experience it. And they say that they sometimes feel like they just forget things. They call it brain fog. But we really don't know ways to combat this. So very briefly, it took about 57 patients that had anywhere from stage 1 to stage 3 breast cancer, had them initiate aerobic exercise, think simple things, walk, run, different types of cardio, either at the onset of chemotherapy or even at about the midpoint of chemotherapy. But in all the participants who did regular exercise, after about 12 weeks, they reported improvement in symptoms and decreased that kind of brain fog and problems with the memory. So here we have some doctor's orders that are take it to really to kind of tailor your chemotherapy regimen and talk about this with your doctor and to also kind of take it slow, but kind of pace yourself, but be able to implement an exercise program and how exercise can be medicine in this case along with your cancer treatment. This next study out of the University of Alabama at Birmingham saying that people with a type 2 diabetes who follow a lower carb diet can manage their condition better and they may even be able to, to stop their medication. It won't be the case for everyone, but what do people need to know here? Yeah, so again, a smaller study, also 57 adults. And in this case, they took half of these adults with type 2 diabetes, so not insulin dependent diabetes, but half of them gave them a lower carbohydrate diet. So we're not talking keto, Christine, but just lower carbs overall. The other half had kind of a regular diet, just a little bit modified, but not anywhere near like the other half of the control group. And what they followed over time is how their beta cells, which are their cells in their pancreas, which release insulin, how their beta cells responded and how their overall sugars were doing. And lo and behold, Christine, they saw that people with a lower carbohydrate diet, as you pointed out, in some cases, could even stop some of their medications, but in all across the board, low carb meant that their beta cells improved some of their insulin response. So this was really interesting because it's just diet could really have an effect here. Here are the doctor's orders though, or that to your point, we don't really necessarily recommend stopping medication from a low carb diet. It's a small study, so we really have to understand. But in this case, it's something where it's worth pointing out, talking to your doctor about this and thinking about modifying the diet. And it could just be part of what we're understanding, we talk about exercise as medicine. This is diet as medicine in a certain way. Diet as medicine. Um, and ending on a high note, Doc, uh, we know how powerful music can be, but there's a, a review of studies, one review of studies presented at the American uh, College of Surgeons annual meeting found that music may help you recover from surgery. How does that work? Yeah, don't all of us talk about like our favorite song and how we use it just to even relax? So this is looking at patients post-op at different points in time, any in different kinds of surgeries, but looking at patients in all of these are studies of studies. So about 35 studies in the literature overall looking at the effects of music 
even the day after surgery, Christy, if you can believe this, one of the studies found that people could reduce the amount of pain medication that they needed in half just by introducing music after post-op recovery. So this is one of those like studies that goes, aha, I knew that this could work, <laughs> but now we actually have proof that music can be medicine. We've got a theme here today. But in this case, take your tunes in with you. Talk about the surgery. When you're talking to the surgeon and prep for your surgery, actually talk about the playlist that you want to talk about it with your loved ones, because in this case, it could really make a difference. Pain reduction, improvements from surgery, and post-op recovery. Is there a song on your post-surgery playlist, Doc? Oh, it's it's all Taylor Swift. I, <laughs> I, I am I'm all about the heiress tour, so you give me anything. I'm a midnight girl, so yes. <laughs> All right, what we've learned today, diet, exercise, and Taylor Swift. That's all we, That's <laughs> we right. need to be healthy. <laughs> Dr. Patel, thank you so much. Thank you. Right. October is National Principals Month, and this morning one principal is being honored for making a major impact in students' lives. Tracy Anderson Swilly, principal of Fairfield, Fairfield Central High School in Winsboro, South Carolina, uh, has been named the 2024-25 National Principal of the Year by the National Association of Secondary School Principals. And Tracy Anderson Swilly joins us now to talk about her honor and her career. Good morning, congratulations. How does it feel to be recognized for all your hard work? Good morning, um, I'm still in awe, amazement, excitement, um, elated. So all of the feelings are still here from this past weekend. And fresh, I, I wanna take a moment to talk about your achievements here. Under your leadership, uh, Fairfield Central High School is seeing the highest graduation rate in school history. Uh, black students who make up 88% of the student body are seeing double digit increases in math and reading proficiency. 81% of the year's graduating class were accepted to two or four year colleges. It's, I get goosebumps looking at this <laughs> this roster here. What drives you to work so hard for these kids? They drive me. Um, we have to remember that we are responsible for the future of our young people. Um, and so they are my motivation. I am a mother as well. And so when I tell them when they all walk in the door, their last name is Swilly until they go home to their parents. So just as I'm going to go hard for my personal children, we go hard for our students here at Fairfield Central because they are our future. I love that. You've also pushed for non-academic changes like telehealth for students, extra buses so they can participate in after-school activities. Talk to me about that whole approach here. Why is that also important for you? Well, we have to take care of the whole child. We can't just act like children are going to come ready for math, English, science, and social studies. So we have to check on their emotional well-being, their mental well-being, their physical health. We know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We have to make certain that the child has what they need in order to be successful in school. And so that's been our focus here, ensuring that our culture and climate, we provide the right environment for our students. They're just like plants. A plant cannot grow in the wrong environment, nor can a child grow in an, a, an environment in your school that is not adequate for their success. So we have to take care of the whole child, and that's what we aim to do here at Fairfield Central. And Principal Spillie, this is clearly very personal for you. I, I hear you even have tattoos that remind you of the struggles and triumphs. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I love tattoos. Um, and I would say I, I use that as a conversation piece for my students because that is something that the young people do. Um, so I encourage them to make certain they have meaning. Um, I do have one, some that signify my personal beliefs, whether it be my faith, as I tell my staff, faith, family, then Fairfield Central in that order. Um, I also have one in memory of a student that we lost here at Fairfield Central en route to school. Um, um, and so just, you know, investing and engulfed in the whole community um, is my life's work. And so I am excited to use um, something that's personally relevant to me, but also makes that connection for our students um, and sharing with them the why of what we do um, so that they can make good, positive choices as well. We appreciate your work, the work of all educators. Tracy Anderson Swilly, thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you. All right, coming up, the IRS has announced new federal income tax brackets for 2025. What does it mean for you? Friend of the show, Caleb Silver, is here to help break it all down. That's next. Okay, welcome back. The IRS has announced new federal income tax brackets and standard deductions for next year. The new policies kick in at the start of the new year and will apply to income earned 
in 2025 for the returns filed in 2026. Oh, I love taxes. Our friend and investment media editor-in-chief, Caleb Silver, joins us now to break down the changes and what it means for your wallet. Good morning. Okay, so the IRS raised the income thresholds for each tax bracket, but at a smaller percentage than in recent years. That's because inflation overall is cooling, I suppose. That's right. 2.8%, which is the smallest adjustment in several years. Again, this applies to next year's filings or for this year when you'll file taxes in 2025. 2.8%. Last year, 5.4% given how high inflation was yeah. in 2023, 7%. So what are they doing? They adjust the income brackets so we don't get what we call bracket creep. You need to make more, and the more you make above your tax bracket, the more you'll pay in taxes. But this is a small adjustment, but there's some other things that are super important here, like the higher standard deduction yeah. for individuals now. That's $15,000. A lot of people take the standard deduction. It's a lot easier. It's hard to come up with all those other deductions for 15000 For married couples, that's 30000 Both of those are up. 400 bucks for uh, individuals and about a thousand bucks for married couples. Big standard deduction increase there. Also, changes to the effective tax rate. This is the money you make above that income threshold. That's what you get taxed on. Also, made changes to policies like eligibility for the child tax credit, the state tax exemption. What are some of the other big takeaways there from that? Yeah, some, so they've made some adjustments there, but they haven't adjusted. The child tax credit, that's 2000 bucks. Everybody's been waiting for either the Biden administration or potentially the next administration to put the child tax credit back into where it was. That's super helpful for families. The more kids you have, the bigger the exemption you take. So that's kind of waiting in the wings. Some things that weren't adjusted, the SALT break, this is the state yep. local tax exemption, that wasn't adjusted either. Neither, again, was that child care tax credit. So I think a lot of people don't realize that the 2017 tax cuts, the Tax Cuts and Job Act that President um, Trump and the Congress passed, that expires in 2025. So we're talking about these changes, but there's really big tax changes that could be happening right around the corner. Right. We could revert back to those old levels, especially for higher income tax uh, payers. That could go from 37 percent right now for the highest income tax payers to back to 39.6 percent. So uh, Trump and the Trump campaign talking about extending those tax cuts. We haven't really heard much on whether uh, the Harris administration, if it gets into the Oval Office, is going to do that. But that is a big economic issue. When people talk about the economy, being the number one issue. They don't necessarily think about taxes. Yeah. Taxes is probably the thing that impacts you the most. Her campaign has said that they will make sure that they will not raise any taxes on people making $400,000 a year or less, but she would raise taxes on corporations and high earners. So there's that's that's where we are, and that will be a big deal when that starts Absolutely. to happen. All right. Best tips for keeping track of all these changes and sort of keeping on top of <laughs> of your tax your tax uh, information? Yeah, the IRS, irs.gov has the new brackets, Buzz. So, so does NBCNews.com. Everybody's been writing about these new brackets. Make sure you know which bracket you're in, but also know that you're going to be taxed on that marginal income above the amount you make. It's not like your whole income gets taxed at whatever rate you're in, but also know these rates went up, but so did our salaries, about 4% year over year. That's why these were adjusted higher, yep. just not as high as the past couple of years. All right, Caleb, so nice to see you. Thank you. All right, we're now uh, taking you to the waters off the iconic Monterey Bay in California for a look at how artificial intelligence and scientists are working as one. NBC News Chief Environmental Affairs Correspondent Ann Thompson introduces us to a revolutionary tool that's changing the game in tracking some of the world's largest mammals. Hey there, oceans make up 70% of the Earth's surface, and swimming in those waters all around the globe are humpback whales. But how long do they live? How many are they? And where did they go? Those are just some of the questions a California researcher is trying to answer with technology. Oh, I just saw a whale. <laughs> really? It's feeding time for humpback whales off of California's central coast. Oh, whales behind us. And prime time for scientist Ted Cheeseman. There they are. The cold water offering the whales an all-you-can-eat buffet of anchovies and krill. Whoa! Once hunted to near extinction, whales are now resurfacing here in Monterey Bay in dramatic numbers. Now with just a camera, photos from scientists and the public are helping researchers track whales from anywhere around the world. He can really see that whale there. Thanks to artificial intelligence in real time, he can match their tails or flukes. Oh my gosh, and look at the matches. That tell stories of where the whales have been and how healthy they are. How do you know that's a killer whale scar? By the, the parallel lines there. The pictures are uploaded and matched on Cheeseman's website happy whale. Through AI, that image is matched to other whales already photographed, like this one called Old Timer. 
and Monet. Our last recorded sighting of Monet was back in February down in Oaxaca, Mexico. Now, is it true that no two whale tails are alike? Absolutely. Really? You know, like a fingerprint yeah. or a face. Every humpback whale's tail is distinct. Cheeseman says it's facial recognition technology that makes this possible and fast. How long does it take you per photo? We, we don't measure the time. It's instantaneous. Over 100,000 humpbacks identified. Some migrate thousands of miles, navigating threats from fishing lines and waters warmed by climate change, making food harder to find. But Cheeseman says the most valuable information gained may be human. You connect with one whale, it connects you with the whole ocean. To have that healthy ocean, we have to treat it like it's part of our home. It's like it's a place we care about. Using technology to connect and preserve the ocean for everyone and everything. Before AI identifying the whales was a time-consuming process, Cheeseman actually had to look at photos with his own eyes and try to see if they matched. It was an imprecise science. Now technology allows for much more precision. And Cheeseman says if you want to help out, the best pictures come from cameras with telephoto lenses. I'm Ann Thompson in New York. Now back to you. All right, Ann, thank you so much. After the break, an Oregon teen reached for the stars and did not miss his out-of-this-world accomplishment that's making friends in high places. We end the hour with an incredible accomplishment of one Oregon teenager who for years dreamed of talking to astronauts in space. Reporter Devin Haskins from our affiliate station KGW in Portland was there when he finally reached for the stars and succeeded. 1.4 maximum at 148. Outside the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum. We're very excited. Handmade antennas spin on a bluff, searching for a signal out of this world. This is the main antenna that it's going to communicate with its base station as it traverses overhead. You should be able to rotate it. And while this type of science and math yeah, just that one. might make our heads spin. Good. Okay, hit it. It's a challenge. Seven, Lima, November with key testing. Uh, we have two hours. 13-year-old Zeke Wheeler welcomes. Yeah. If there is a problem, we switch to our backup antenna. So it will work. As the International Space Station orbits high above the Earth. We just need to kind of tie it off. Down low, a crew of volunteers and family help set up the equipment on the bluff that will make Zeke's five-year-long mission of talking with the ISS come to life. This mission started when I was eight years old, and I asked my dad, how can I contact an astronaut on the International Space Station? But he didn't know. So through research and determination, Open yeah. he found his answer in a ham radio. And if I got my ham radio license, I would be able to use it to talk to astronauts on the International Space Station. Among those helping today, I'm the muscle. <laughs> his grandpa, Mark. It sends chills up my spine to see where he's at. In a digital world, sometimes the best connection is still analog. And what they didn't buy, they built. I made all of the 3D printed boxes and their buttons. But even with all that, they still needed a way to connect to outer space. But then we found ARIS, this, uh, the NASA's educational outreach program that does schedule calls between students or uh, organizations and an astronaut. With help from ARIS and his online charter school, Teach Northwest, they were given permission from NASA and a 10-minute window of time to talk with astronaut Sunita Williams. We've got a little less than two hours. And with the final checks in place... Have you tried powering up the, the ham and seeing if you can make contact and making sure... It was finally work? time. Anyone assess? Anyone assess? Anyone assess? This is Kilo Juliet 7 November Lima Lima. After five years, his mom watched as her son, Zeke, yes, he did it. I'm so relieved. Had answered the one question he was determined to answer. Sunita, this is Kilo Juliet, 7 November, Lima Lima. It is a great honor to connect with you today. I, I read you five. He wasn't here to talk with Williams, though. He just wanted to prove that he could. And are you ready to receive questions? Yes, Tech Northwest, it's great to hear your voice, and I'm ready for questions. And with the signal established, he turned over the microphone to his online classmates, many of them 
he'd never met before. What is your mission while you were up there? Over. Hi, Elise. Um, our mission was actually to test the spacecraft while coming up here. And Wheeler had connected to space. What does your day-to-day -day look like at the International Space Station? During the day, we have all sorts of different activities, science experiments, medical experiments, maintenance. His classmates had talked with an astronaut. And with every question asked and answered, the 10-minute window closed. Thank you so much, Sunita, and we are about to lose contact. Zeke had proven to himself the possibilities of his imagination are endless. <laughs> I want to get more kids interested in hands-on STEM and doing projects like this. Our thanks to Devin Haskins for bringing us that incredible report proving the sky really is the limit. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Right now on Morning News Now, the countdown is on. We are officially less than two weeks out from Election Day, and the stars are showing up for Vice President Harris, both former President Obama and rapper Eminem stumping at a raucous rally in Battleground, Michigan last night, while the VP herself sits down with NBC News discussing the possibility of former President Trump declaring victory early. This is a person, Donald Trump, who tried to undo the, a free and fair election, who still denies the will of the people, who incited a violent mob to attack the United States Capitol and 140 law enforcement officers were attacked. Some were, were killed. We've got the latest from the campaign trail as the Trump campaign pushes back on some damning criticism coming from Trump's own former chief of staff. Also this morning, a deadly health crisis that's shaking the largest fast food chain in the country. How McDonald's is responding to a severe E. coli outbreak, impacting one menu staple, and what you need to know the next time you hit the drive-thru. It's not really feeling like fall for millions across the Northeast. This morning, record-setting heat uh, warming up several states and major cities. Bone-dry conditions even sparking a dangerous wildfire in Connecticut that so far burned dozens of acres. How climate change is playing into these unseasonably high temps. And you can buy a whole lot of peanuts and Cracker Jack for the price of a ticket to the World Series this year. How much fans are shelling out to get to the ball game? Good Wednesday morning. I'm Christine Romans in for Joe and Savannah. We begin this hour with a build up to Election Day as the race for the White House enters the final stretch. Vice President Kamala Harris says her team is considering the possibility that former President Trump could try to claim victory prematurely on election night. She discussed the scenario with NBC's Hallie Jackson in a one on one interview Tuesday. During the wide ranging conversation, Harris talked about her plans for the economy and also said America is ready for a female president of color. Here's Hallie with more of her interview. Hey there, good morning to you. The push is now on to try to win over those so-called late deciders, a small but crucial group who could help decide this very close race as Democrats, including the vice president herself in our conversation, make their closing argument about the dangers of a second Trump term. With under two weeks to go, former President Obama hitting the campaign trail. I voted yesterday. President Barack Obama. Later introduced by Eminem in Michigan and taking a turn at the mic himself. I'm nervous, but on the surface, I look calm and ready to drop bombs. Rallying supporters for Vice President Kamala Harris. Let me tell you, your vote is going to matter. In New Hampshire, the current president campaigning for his vice president, warning of the dangers of a second Trump term and saying this. We got to lock him up. <laughs> Political lock him up. Lock him out. That's what we have to do. The Trump campaign calling on Vice President Harris to condemn the comment, despite Mr. Trump repeatedly using similar language against then opponent Hillary Clinton in 2016. Lock her up is right. It comes as Vice President Harris sits down in a new one on one with NBC News, continuing to back President Biden as she did after his debate performance, widely panned as disastrous in June. Joe Biden is a, an extremely accomplished. Um, experienced and, um, and, and capable in every way that anyone would want if they're president. You Absolutely. never saw anything like what happened at the debate night behind closed doors with him? It was a bad debate. People have bad debates. Should he? That, it, he is absolutely... But that's the reason why you're here, and he's not running for the top of the ticket. Well, you'd have to ask him if that's the only reason why. In 2020, a race he lost, we Mr. Trump declared victory before all the votes election. were counted. Frankly, we did win this election. 
What is your plan if he does that again in two weeks? Well, let me say this. We've got two weeks to go. And I'm very much grounded in the present in terms of the task at hand. And we will deal with election night and the days after as they come. And we have the resources and the expertise and the, and, and the focus on that as well. So you have My teams ready to go? Is that what you're saying? Are you thinking about that as a possibility? Of course. We asked about the issue of abortion access if Republicans were to win control of Congress. There's a question of pragmatism then. What concessions would be on the table? Religious exemptions, for example? Is that something that you would consider? Like I don't think we should be Congress? making concessions when we're talking about a fundamental freedom to make decisions about your own body. And on the issue of reproductive rights, the vice president is set to travel to Texas later in the week. Not exactly a traditional presidential battleground, of course, but she's hoping to highlight that state's restrictive abortion law. Her campaign sees reproductive rights as a huge mobilizing issue that could persuade those late deciders to break her way. Texas is also home to a key Senate race. Democrats hope to flip blue, but Republicans hope to hang on to. Back to you. All right, Hallie, thanks so much. Halloween may be right around the corner, but for millions of Americans, still feels like summer, with temperatures pushing into the 80s in some cities yesterday. The East Coast has also been experiencing a historic dry streak, affecting cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Atlanta. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa is in Woodland, New Jersey, and joins me now with more Good Morning. Uh, good morning, Emily. Hey there, Christine. Well, not only is it unusually warm, but this region hasn't seen rain for several weeks, leading to these kinds of bone dry conditions. Some firefighters tell me they have never seen the pinelands this dry. And you can see on the ground here, fallen leaves, debris, these kinds of pine needles, all volatile fuel for fire. It's supposed to be fall with cool, crisp weather, but this October has seen record-setting heat across the Northeast. I like it a little cooler, but I'll take it. With temperatures nearly 20 degrees higher than normal in Philadelphia. We're trying to take advantage of it before it gets cold. Many cities along the East Coast have approached or hit historic highs in the upper 70s and 80s, and the warm streak continues today. At the same time, drought conditions are expanding in nearly every state. Some in the tri-state area are calling this month Dry-tober. Cities like New York and Philadelphia could see their first October on record with zero rainfall. The unusually warm temperatures and dry conditions creating new challenges in Connecticut, where the Berlin wildfire has burned upwards of 90 acres so far along Lamentation Mountain. You can smell it and you can see it. An added challenge, dry brush like leaves on the ground refueling the fires. We're getting a lot more ground fire than we normally do because it's been so dry. So right now we have a, a, a full ban on any burning whatsoever. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, climate change has led to an increase in the size and frequency of wildfires, as well as the length of the season, something the New Jersey Forest Fire Service says it's witnessed. Fire seasons are not seasonal anymore, and they've actually become year-round. And there were more than 100 wildfires in New Jersey last week alone. You can still smell the smoke in the air and fire officials reminding us that the vast majority of wildfires in the U.S., some reports suggesting up to 90 percent are caused by people. And Christine, many of them are preventable. Yeah, good, good advice there. Emily Aketa, thank you so much. Now let's get to NBC uh, meteorologist Angie Lastman. She's been keeping a close eye on the above average temperatures for us this morning. Angie, good morning. Good morning, Christine. You heard Emily talking about how all of that is, is of course, influencing that fire weather we're dealing with. But let's take a big picture look at the drought conditions that we're going to see here moving forward through the next couple of months. This is from NOAA Climate Prediction Center. You can see where you see those greens, parts of the Midwest, the Great Lakes, stretching out to the Pacific Northwest. That's where we're expecting the drought conditions to improve. Now, the other side of that coin is that we, we see a big big chunk of the country that likely will see worsening drought conditions or even expanding drought conditions across parts of the South. This is thanks in part to that La Nina pattern that we are currently in. In the meantime, though, you heard me, uh, uh, Emily mention that we've got that red flag warning still up for parts of Connecticut. It's going to be dry. It's going to be breezy. It's going to be warm through the day today. So we're still going to look for all of those ingredients to not only cause uh, those fires to spread quickly, uh, but to be something that we deal with even into the next couple of days until we start to see a 
bit of a cool down. There is a cool down coming for that region, but not today. We still have the 90s for Dallas. We've got upper 80s for Houston, Memphis, Jackson into the mid 80s this afternoon. We've got Lexington headed to 78 degrees and even Philadelphia running about 15 degrees above normal for this time of year. Your high today is 78 degrees. So these temperatures a little more like late summer instead of, you know, late October. We will see some improvements as far as temperatures are concerned across the northeast, but check out places like Minneapolis tomorrow, still into the mid 60s. Doesn't seem like a crazy high number, right? But it's it's over 10 degrees above where we should be for late October. 90 degrees though in Oklahoma City, in Lubbock, you're going to head to the 90s as well. Mid 80s expected for Little Rock and Jackson into the upper 80s. Now, looking ahead to your end of your work week and into your weekend, that's when we really start to feel a little more like fall, especially across the Great Lakes and the Northeast. New York City, mid to upper 60s for Friday and Saturday, not bad temperatures there. We get a little cooler on Sunday as we head down to those upper 50s. We've got Green Bay kind of hovering in that upper 50, low 60 range as we round out our weekend. We've got the low 60s on Sunday for Chicago. And even Cincinnati, you go from 77 degrees on Friday to the low 60s on Sunday. So some of that cooler fall air will start to settle in. But how about the rain chances? We unfortunately don't have a whole lot of those coming our way uh, across parts of the Northeast. We'll have a couple of spots that may pick up a little bit of rain, but most of these showers kind of dry up as this front swings through. Now that's the front that's going to bring us that reinforcing kind of shot of cooler air to bring our temperatures back to where they should be over the next couple of days for that region. But then we'll turn our attention to this next front that's going to work across parts of the upper Midwest. That's where we're going to watch for the potential for some rainfall. We will see uh, the chance for some of those stronger storms to develop. Uh, if you live in Iowa, Missouri, those are some of the spots that we're going to watch for that large hail. But otherwise, we'll get just a good dose of, of a little bit of rain up to a half an inch centered across Cedar, Rap Cedar Rapids to Madison and out towards Rockford. Looking way ahead, I know it's Wednesday, but why not look at the weekend? <laughs> uh, we've got that record warmth that's still going to be possible across parts of the south. We'll see a couple of those scattered showers as that system works a little farther to the east. Uh, That'll work across the Great Lakes for your Friday, but out west, gorgeous weather, sunny, nice, and honestly, even Saturday, we've got a whole lot of sunshine on tap. Outdoor plans look great. It'll be a little chilly across the Great Lakes, uh, but typical kind of fall-like weather, still 80s across parts of the southeast. That warmth will continue, and we will start to watch for that next west coast storm to kind of gear up across parts of the Pacific Northwest, and that leaves us so with Sunday, Christine. Uh, plenty of sunshine, mild conditions for a lot of folks. I, I think it's been a, a very quiet weather yeah. week and we like that and we will take it all the way through the week and it is never too soon to look to the weekend no thank you never I too agree. soon Glad so we're on the same i'm page. with you <laughs> thanks andy <laughs> of course. all right and now to a food safety alert as the cdc sounds the alarm on a deadly e coli outbreak spreading through one of the largest fast food chains in the world the agency now rushing to contain at least 49 food poisoning cases in 10 states connected to mcdonald's quarter pounder hamburgers the outbreak has led to 10 people being hospitalized and one death. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa joins me now from their headquarters with the latest. Maggie, good morning. Hey, Christine, good morning. Yeah, as you put it, an absolute crisis now for the iconic Golden Arches. The CDC confirming late yesterday this outbreak, as you said, has already sickened nearly 50 people and cost one person their life. And now McDonald's is racing to contain the damage. This morning, an American fast food icon fielding a deadly crisis. If you're eating fast food, be careful out there. The CDC confirming a fast-moving outbreak of E. coli tied to restaurant giant McDonald's. Adding among the nearly 50 customers sickened in 10 states, 10 have been hospitalized, including a child who's now developed kidney disease. The CDC adding an older person in Colorado has died. In most of the cases, the agency says customers report eating a widely advertised menu staple, the Quarter Pounder. The hottest, juiciest Quarter Pounder yet. Headlines of the outbreak spreading like wildfire on social media. Do not eat McDonald's again until you see this. Within hours, McDonald's USA President Joe Erlinger issuing this video, saying in part. Because food safety is so important to me and everyone at McDonald's. 
The company in a written statement adding while the exact source of the outbreak remains under investigation, it may be linked to slivered onions used in the quarter pounder and sourced by a single supplier that serves three distribution centers. Promising swift and decisive action, McDonald's says it's removed the slivered onions and temporarily the quarter pounder itself from restaurants in the impacted area and other states. Former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb points out the chain's practice is to cook patties at 170 degrees, 10 degrees hotter than it takes to kill E. coli, adding the company gets them from multiple beef suppliers, making contaminated meat a less likely scenario. How big of a crisis is this for McDonald's? Significant, potentially significant. Food industry writer Jonathan Mays credits McDonald's swift action, but notes impacts may be long lasting. There's going to be a lot of publicity about this. People are going to stop going to McDonald's. All right, so amid all of that, let's talk about timing. The CDC notes these illnesses in this outbreak were reported between September 27th and October 11th, but they also note it's very possible that since October 11th, more people have gotten sick because they say it can take up to four weeks to link individual cases to an ongoing outbreak. Christine. Yeah, so we'll be looking to see if there are any more reports. Uh, Maggie, thank you so much. And we heard from McDonald's President Joe Erlinger when he spoke to Craig Melvin on the Today Show a little earlier. Here's some of that conversation starting with how an outbreak like this could have started. How did something like this happen? Yeah, I mean, food safety is, you know, our top priority at McDonald's. The top priority in this building where I am at the McDonald's headquarters is the top priority in our nearly 14,000 McDonald's restaurants. Uh, across the U.S. and it's a top priority uh, for our suppliers as well. Um, this is something that we talk about as being everyone's business. And so while the investigation continues and we'll get in, uh, you know, continue to get into the details of those investigations, uh, I don't think that's what's important. What's important today is that we've taken the action to protect um, the American public and promote public health. 49, uh, six so far, one dead across 10 states. Um, do we expect those numbers to rise? Uh, you know, we'll rely upon the CDC, obviously, to do their investigations and to do their tracing. But it is important to note that the, the onset dates for this disease are, are between, at this point, September 27th and October 11th. Uh, if there has been a uh, contaminated product within our supply chain, uh, it's very likely worked itself um, through uh, that, that supply chain already. Um, but, uh, but certainly we'll be working with the, the CDC and cooperating with them uh, on the investigation, uh, and, and we'll, we'll we'll take in more data and let the let the science continue to to lead our actions. Well, really quickly here, Joe, price is up, of course. I believe somewhere roughly around forty percent over the last five years at McDonald's. You guys have been doing a whole lot of work to get folks to come back into your restaurants uh, using using deals and whatnot. As you know, things like this can can do a fair amount of reputational damage. As we sit here, how worried are you uh, that this is uh, going to keep folks from coming back to McDonald's in the long term? Yeah, thanks, Craig, for this question. Um, you know, our founder famously said, if you take care of our, cu our customers, the business will take care of itself. And so on a day like today, um, given the news we've had over the last 24 hours, that's really our focus. And, you know, we're confident um, uh, that, that we'll see our way through this and we'll restore um, confidence uh, for the American consumer to come to McDonald's. All right. McDonald's President Joe Erlinger. Joe, thank you. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you, Craig. All right. Joining us now with, to discuss more on what you need to know about this outbreak is NBC News medical contributor Dr. Vin Gupta. Dr. Gupta, good morning. You know, millions of people eat at McDonald's every single day. So how worried should people be about this outbreak? Well, you know, Christine, this is so we're very much pending the outbreak investigation, as the McDonald's president just said. But I do if, if it is October 11th as the guardrail date for when we think that this ended, incubation periods for E. coli in, in food poisoning are about three to four days. So I would I'm cautiously optimistic, Christine, that we won't see many more cases and that the worst of it has passed us. It's not known which ingredient exactly is causing people to get sick, but the fast food chains have since stopped using these slivered onions and the quarter pound beef patties. The CDC has said the recent illnesses may not be reported yet, right? So how can a person determine if they have actually been sickened in this outbreak? 
You know, typically, if so, if you're developing GI symptoms, high fevers, uh, greater than 102, with those GI symptoms, and say in the last 72 hours you've eaten McDonald's, this was where it's really important, Christine, to do a food audit. What have you eaten? And if you've eaten fast food from McDonald's, think about what that was. And if you had onion products or a quarter pounder, uh, it's likely that you need to go and present yourself to a medical attention if you have severe symptoms, especially. So if you see blood when you're using the bathroom. Again, if you have persistently high fevers, that's worrisome. But that's what I would encourage all your viewers to do. Do a food audit, especially if you're having those symptoms. And if you have those symptoms, if you think you are affected by this outbreak, you've had those symptoms, you've had a quarter pounder at McDonald's in, in recent weeks, they should call their doctor. They should if it's severe. And so uh, the way I classify severe, Christine, is that a persistently high fever over 102 uh, and an inability to keep down fluids. That's when you really want to see your physician or your medical provider. If you have mild to moderate symptoms, you can still drink, you can hold down fluids. Um, it, you know, you're not going to the bathroom more than just a few times a day. Often E. coli is, is self-limited. You can take care of it at home with symptom control and hydration. You don't even need antibiotics in most cases. So again, if it's severe, yes, notify medical your, your medical providers. If not, and that's the majority of cases, it will pass on its own. All right, Dr. Van Gupta, thank you so much. Thank you. More to come on this hour of morning news now. A little later, we'll bring you the scoop on some new rules from American Airlines, pushing back on the so-called boarding group jumpers. But first, after the break, Putin's PR push, what Russia's BRICS summit featuring leaders from around the globe could mean for Moscow's relationship with superpowers like China and India. That's next. Stay with us. Welcome back. More than 20 world leaders are gathering in Russia for the BRICS Summit of Emerging Economies. The alliance was formed as an economic and political counterweight to the West, with members that in initially included uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. The group has since expanded by four more countries. The event seen as an opportunity by the Kremlin to push back on attempts to isolate Moscow over the Ukraine war. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons is at the summit in southwestern Russia and joins me now. Keir, the Kremlin is calling this one of the largest foreign policy events ever in Russia with so many world leaders attending. How much of a PR win is this for Moscow? Well, it's a PR win for sure. I mean, look, if you want crib notes on the challenges that the next American president is going to face around the world, it's a long way from Washington here in Kazan, but you could come here because today what we saw was President Putin uh, standing on a stage uh, side by side with President Xi of China on one side and Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, uh, on the other side. So pretty powerful. I mean, the BRICS countries, as they are known, uh, they represent around 40 percent, around 40 percent of the world population and of world GDP, Christine. So, so you can't dismiss them. That being said, there are many, many uh, conflicts, uh, challenges, tensions between them. So just on that stage, for example, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, the uh, president of the United Arab Emirates, uh, stood alongside uh, President Pazashkian of Iran. I mean, I mentioned uh, Modi and Xi. Of course, uh, China and India ha have tense relations. There's been a question this week about whether or not they would actually have a, a bilateral uh, meeting. And just from the statements that they've been making today, uh, you saw the different agendas. So, for example, uh, the Chinese uh, president, President Xi, uh, talking about wanting peace in, in, in the world, including in Ukraine, and not wanting to, quote, pour fuel on the fire. Now, that's an implicit criticism of the, the U.S.'s support uh, for Ukraine. Uh, but it's also, isn't it, sort of standing a little bit uh, away from from uh, Russia's position uh, on uh, Ukraine. So we shouldn't dismiss uh, the, the, the differences between these different countries. At the same time, what you're seeing there are adversaries of the US and partners and allies of the US standing together. And their message is that they want some kind of independence from US dominance in the world. Again, uh, for the next American president, this is the kind of world that they're going to be facing. Talk to us about the agenda here. We know that the Russian president has already had meetings with the Chinese president and India's prime minister. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you, you asked at the beginning there, Christine, about whether this is a win for President uh, Putin. Uh, you know, in many ways, uh, this does feel like the President Putin show, you know, Putin optics, if you like, uh, where he's meeting with one leader after another. And, and the message is, you know, I'm not isolated. Despite the International Criminal Court indicting me, despite the criticism from around the world over Ukraine, I'm not isolated. But of course, this meeting is happening in Russia. The last BRICS meeting outside of Russia, he couldn't attend. And there are many places in the world that he can't go. So it's a mixed bag, if you like. Certainly, India and China, for example, have been sustaining Russia's economy despite the war in Ukraine, despite calls by the US and by West, its Western allies uh, for them not to do that. They have been doing that. So the truth is that President Putin is not as isolated as the US and, and the West would like. On the other hand, he is diminished because although he's holding a, a summit like this, he has to have it in his own country. Yeah, and we understand that President Putin is going to meet with the president of one of the newer members of the alliance, Iran, later today, and NATO member Turkey looking to join yeah. this group. What are you expecting? Yeah, well, he's going to meet with President Pazhashkian. We were, Christine, expecting there to be an announcement. When I say we were, Iran suggested that they would uh, sign a, a new agreement uh, with uh, Russia, we, uh, and that hasn't happened. We assume it's going to happen at some point, but it's a similar agreement that Russia signed with North Korea just earlier uh, this year. So there will be again, I mean, to ignore what's happening here in Kazan and with these countries would be foolish. It's a sign again of a growing alliance between Russia and North Korea and Iran and countries like China. And that is something that that is a threat uh, and that frankly uh, the US will be hoping that those divisions that I talked about continue because if if they were truly united that would be a real threat yeah all right here thank you so much South Korea is issuing a stark you warning bet. after North Korean troops were dispatched to Russia NBC reporter Matt Bodner joins me now with more on that good morning Matt Christine, good morning. Let's kick things off this hour on the Korean Peninsula, where South Korean officials have said that they will consider supplying weapons to Ukraine. Both Ukraine and South Korean officials say that North Korea has sent thousands of troops to Russia to join the fight against Ukraine. Both Russia and North Korea have denied these claims, but the United States today, for the first time, has confirmed that North Korea has sent troops to Russia. South Korea says that the North's involvement in the war is a, quote, grave security threat to South Korea and to the international community. NATO, for its part, has said that such a development, if true, would mark a, quote, significant escalation. South Korea, for the record, is not a member of NATO. Moving along now to Cuba, where Hurricane Oscar has killed at least six people. Oscar is a Category 1 storm, and it made landfall near the city of Baracoa on Sunday before weakening to a tropical storm. The storm did deal plenty of damage, taking the heaviest toll on the province of Guantanamo, where more than 1,000 homes were damaged by heavy rains and strong winds. Oscar continues to move northeastward, threatening to cause flash flooding across the southeastern Bahamas. And we'll wrap up this hour in Australia, where a woman found herself trapped between two boulders as she attempted to rescue her phone when it fell between them. The incident took place in the Hunter Valley wine region. That's about 150 miles north of Sydney. The woman slipped between the two rocks, and she actually managed to get stuck upside down. Her friends were on site, and they did try to help her out, but they were ultimately unsuccessful. They called rescuers who made it to the woman after about an hour. She'd been suspended uh, upside down for that period of time. In the end, she was rescued as part of an elaborate operation to move one of those 1,000-pound boulders. The phone, I'm sorry to report, was not recovered. Back to you. Phone is never worth it. It's never worth it. Matt Bodner, thank you so much. To Texas now, where police are searching for a mother of four last seen fighting with her husband more than two weeks ago. NBC News correspondent Jesse Kirsch brings us the latest on the investigation. The desperate search for this missing Texas mother of four is still going more than two weeks after Suzanne Simpson disappeared. Hi, I'm Suzanne. Our San Antonio affiliate WOAI reports Simpson, a local realtor, was last seen outside her home by a neighbor who told police she was arguing and physically fighting with her husband, Brad Simpson, according to a police report. Authorities, meanwhile, releasing this surveillance image of Suzanne Simpson in the dress they say she was last seen wearing. For days, police searched a nearby landfill, but never found any trace of Simpson. 
At a candlelight vigil days after the disappearance, Simpson's mother telling WOAI that her daughter described being hurt physically by her husband. Simpson's mother fears her daughter is not alive. I just don't understand. I don't understand why it happened. It wasn't part of their life. Brad Simpson is currently in custody, charged with assault and family violence and for not properly registering a short-barreled rifle. Law enforcement says he has not cooperated with investigators searching for his wife. Mr. Simpson's attorney did not immediately respond to NBC News's request for comment, but sees this as a weak case against his client, according to the San Antonio Express News. The newspaper also reports Simpson plans to plead not guilty, according to his attorney. She was an incredible person, and she just had the sweetest disposition. Suzanne Simpson's sister among those shaken still desperately seeking answers. When a mother goes missing, it, it, they don't go missing by accident because mothers have very set schedules of like coming home at night and making dinner, doing the hustle to make some money, taking the kids to their activities. Our thanks to Jesse Kirsch for that report. San Antonio police have now shifted their search for Suzanne Simpson to wooded areas around her home in Almost Park, Texas, as the hunt for the missing mom enters its third week now. Coming up, what does Taylor Swift's Eras Tour have in common with this year's World Series? The answer is uh, you could need to shell out over a grand to get inside. We'll take a look at the astronomical ticket prices that are now nearing all-time record highs and whether fans are ready for it. <laughs> That's next. And we're back with changes for passengers of American Airlines. The company says it is testing new technology that will help gate agents enforce plane boarding rules and keep people from jumping ahead of their boarding group. I can't believe this even happens. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is at LaGuardia <laughs> International Airport in New York City with more on how this change may tackle those bogged up boarding lines. And Sam, this, for those of us who spend a lot of time in airports, this, this is, the suffering is real. <laughs> It drives you crazy. Can't you believe that this happens, Christine? I know you fly a lot. I fly a lot. We have all seen this, whether you do it a little bit or all the time. We know as soon as the boarding process starts, everybody and their mother decides to get up and stand right near the gate. There's actually a term for this. It's called gate lice. And then, yes, some of the more audacious passengers also try to board earlier than they're supposed to in their group. And the gate agents have so much to manage as this is all going on. But American Airlines is now testing out a brand new system that's going to make a beep if you try and board on the wrong group, it could put an end to this madness. The days of the boarding backlog and hijinks may be numbered as American Airlines looks to crack down on a problem that's long plagued passengers. That ain't happening. Thank you. So called boarding group jumpers. Why is it that the boarding of a plane brings out the absolute worst in humanity? American announcing it's currently testing new tech that will tell gate agents when someone's trying to board ahead of their assigned group, alerting them with an audible beep and an on-screen message. This is not just a problem for American Airlines. This is across all airlines where people are sort of boarding out of line. Get that coveted overhead bin space. The airline has already rolled out the new system in Albuquerque, Tucson, and Reagan National, saying they are pleased with the results so far. Adding, the new technology is designed to ensure customers receive the benefits of priority boarding with ease and helps improve the boarding experience. It all comes as more travelers take to social media to air out their frustrations. You know you're on board Group 78. You, 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 you ain't no reason for you to be hanging out in front of the line, holding people up. Boarding gate grievances even spoofed on Saturday Night Live. We'd now like to welcome any travelers with carry-ons that have no chance of fitting in the overhead for compartment. <laughs> American now joining a fleet of airlines reevaluating their boarding procedures. This summer, Southwest announced it would ditch its famed open seating policy starting next year after it found 80% of its customers would prefer an assigned seat. When a customer defects from Southwest to another competitor, it's the number one reason. Meanwhile, United Airlines recently updating the way passengers board its planes, now opting for the Wilma method, loading passengers in order from window, middle, then aisle seats to save an average of two minutes. As American looks to curtail line cutters, the effort to make boarding a breeze may finally take off. So Sam, what does it mean if you're boarding with a family member who might be in a different group than you? Do you have to leave them behind or do they make accommodations for that? <laughs> 
Yeah, no, you know what? I think that's going to be a big concern for a lot of folks when they hear about this, Christine. But no, so many airlines, American included, have policies for family members and parents who are traveling with kids under the age of two. Same thing for United as well. You can request an earlier board time. But at the same token, if your child is three or four or five, there's a lot of flexibility as it concerns families. You just need to have conversations with the gate agents about it, and they're going to try and accommodate you. What you don't want, Christine, is that dreaded beep. But there are definitely ways around it. Back All right, you. Sam Brock, great story. Thanks so much. Uh, more news that might impact future trips to the airport this morning. Spirit and Frontier are back in talks to come together. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins now with that and other financial headlines. Good morning, Silvana. Hey, Christine, good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so Frontier and Spirit Airlines are reportedly reviving merger talks. And if a deal is reached, it would likely happen as part of Spirit restructuring its debt and bankruptcy. Now, both companies have declined comment. Spirit came close to a merger deal with Frontier in 2022, but that was terminated when JetBlue stepped in with a separate offer. However, that nearly $4 billion deal was blocked by the Justice Department. Meanwhile, Amazon is shutting down a service that offers same-day delivery from malls and brick-and-mortar retailers. CNBC has learned the company has halted new developments on the service called Amazon Today. Select retail partners will still be able to fulfill orders through January. Launched in 2022, Amazon Today will elect retailers who sell on Amazon to offer speedy delivery from their physical stores. Amazon's contracted flex drivers who use their own vehicles fetch the packages and drop them at customers' doorsteps within hours of the orders being placed. And it's been a disappointing start to pumpkin spice latte season because shares of Starbucks are sinking after it reported some weaker than expected sales for the most recent quarter. The company is also pulling its financial forecast for the next fiscal year to give its new CEO time to work on a turnaround plan. Customer traffic has been sluggish and Starbucks says fall product offerings such as the iced apple crisp non-dairy cream chai and Frequent app promotions just didn't drive more people into stores. And the PSL, which returned in August and is usually a reliable booster of sales, also didn't help, Christine. Yeah, that new CEO from Chipotle, he's got to take stock of what's happening there and try yeah, to turn that company sure around. Mm -hmm. All right, Savannah, thank you so much. You got it. A controversial New York City landmark is back open to the public. After more than three years, the structure called the Vessel at Hudson Yards was shut down right after it was built in 2021 due to a series of suicides. Reporter Mark Santia from our affiliate NBC New York tells us about the changes that are designed to keep visitors safe. There is a palpable buzz inside this architectural honeycomb. The vessel at Hudson Yards is back open for the first time in three years. Some guests are reveling in the whimsical zigzags. It looks like an acorn. While others are taking the time to reflect and snap up the views. <laughs> I like the vessel. For the Stein family, this is a stop on a cross-country vacation, and Dad is setting some boundaries. You want to climb a little bit more? Okay. You're running? I'm not running, dude. I'm over 50. Being here for the reopening was an unexpected surprise. It's really, really beautiful, in my opinion. It's just something so special. I've never seen anything like it. It's a big moment for the vessel, for Hudson Yards, for New York City to be open again. The vessel was closed in 2021 after four people died by suicide in a span of 18 months. Changes were made to ensure the safety of all guests. So there was a lot of engineering work that we did over that time. We worked with Heather Wick Studio. That's the designer of the vessel. We also worked with a bunch of engineers to figure out a solution. Four stairwells and the adjoining platforms all have these steel mesh barriers, which allow you to still take in these incredible views. This is a steel mesh that, that goes from level to level. It's a little bit different. The geometry of the vessel is fairly complicated, so we had to design that uh, differently on each level. We saw a lot of security keeping watch. I'm so emotional because it's a beautiful place to be. With tears in her eyes, Kelly Rollins, who lives in Hudson Yards and is a travel agent for Brazilian tourists, never thought the vessel would be available again to the public. This reopening? For me, it means about New York City, our resilience. And the worst things happen to New York, but as New York, it's a resilience for sure. Our thanks to Mark Santia for bringing us that report. As an additional safety measure, the top level will remain closed, even though the rest of the structure is now open. And if you or anyone you know is struggling, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988.
All right, coming up, crisis of care. After the break, a closer look at the millions of Americans forced to care for loved ones who've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's because of sky-high health costs. We'll chat with a, a familiar face, real estate mogul Barbara Corcoran, who helped her mother with the disease. At the same time, she was building her real estate empire. She shares her story with us next. We're back with a closer look at a devastating health condition affecting older Americans and those that love and care for them. Nearly 7 million people are currently living with Alzheimer's disease in the U.S., according to the Alzheimer's Association. It is the most common form of dementia affecting a person's memory and behavior over time. High health care costs are a big reason that more than 11 million Americans are providing unpaid care for people in their lives with Alzheimer's or dementia, and it's often a family member. But taking on that uh, care partner role can be a demanding full-time unpaid job. You might recognize our next guest as a real estate mogul and one of the stars of Shark Tank. But Barbara Corcoran was a care partner to her own mother who lived with Alzheimer's for nine years. It was a long haul after nine years, believe me. It is just an unsung heroes or the yes. people who are caring for people with Alzheimer's. So, so lovely to have you here in the studio. Tell us about your mom and this process. You were building a business in real estate. At the same time, you had to care for someone with a progressively deteriorating condition. Well, I, I was fortunate that I had the help of nine siblings to help care for her. Let me get that up front. Great. Building the business for me was easy compared to caring for my mom. Because with a business, you get something done, you see your accomplishments. With Alzheimer's, there's no return on it. It's not as though you can read into it that wasn't something that's not there. Yeah. You, ha you have to take it for yourself that you're doing good. And that was very difficult through the nine years. Your mom was your hero, right? She, oh, she was a love bug. She loved us to death. And everything about her was powerful. So to see her deteriorate with Alzheimer's and lose her memory and be forgetful, which was the early part. But the later part was when she had agitation and Alzheimer's, which really made her a different individual. And I didn't recognize that as a different disease. And I think that's really why I'm speaking about it today. I think a lot of people don't understand the time commitment, but also the financial commitment that comes along with taking somebody yes. with Alzheimer's as the disease progress. You know, I mean, I was just in Wisconsin interviewing a couple who have the same situation, you know, the mm -hmm. security system on the house to make sure they're keeping an eye on the person with dementia and the, 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 the therapies and the, you know, all, there's so much that goes on with it. And there really aren't a lot of resources for people. No, and to do it alone is crazy. There are more resources today. You should really should hold hands and get all the information you want. However, that's not so easily done. A lot of people would like to keep their loved one in home at home too, yes. you know, and some people can't afford to put their uh, loved yes. one in a memory care facility. What is your advice for someone who's trying to deal with this situation at home? At home, you need to have a lot of money. You need to have a lot of support. You need to have people coming into the house. You need to have, to have someone full time watching your loved one. And that's a very expensive way to go. Yeah. Otherwise, you're quitting your own job and you have to do it for your family. <laughs> I doubt that. And it's so, somebody's got to pay. Well, it's so well true. And it's so difficult, though, also because you make the point that the disease is degenerative, that yes, you, the person that you love and know is sort of disappearing in front of you. Talk to me about what that what that is like and how you cope with it. It's very difficult. With, when you're dealing with Alzheimer's, you expect the typical symptoms of forgetfulness, repeating things all the time, getting in the person's time zone where they are versus where you are. That you learn to live with, but you don't learn to live with when they are angry, when they're restless, when they're wandering. That is a separate disease, and that's what I wish I had recognized, that separate really? disease. Yes, very much so. It's, so it's, that's hard to deal with. Yes, it is. It's called agitation and Alzheimer's. So you, it's the person you love who's there with you, but it's also a different version of the person you love sometimes. It's the worst version of the person. I still cannot remember what my mother's eyes looked like. When I think of her, I think of her with those dementia eyes, blanking, staring. Uh, it's, it's just heartbreaking. Talk to me about your family and how your family all pulled together to help. Well, we had 10 siblings in the family, so the first thing we did early when she had easy dementia we all got together and said, what can you do well? And everybody volunteered for something. Some people were local. They were able to visit her. Other kids had more money than the others. They had more time than the other kids. So everybody donated whatever they could. So we really pulled together as a family. And for those people who don't have a family, and that's very unusual, there are many, many support groups where you could get cooperation. I know so many people dealing with it on their own, and there's really no way you could do it on your own. You really need support from someone. Um, the people who are 65 and older, there are 10,000 people a day are turning, 11,000 people a day are wow. turning 65 or older. And that group of the economy is going to be 
quadrupled over the next mm. decade or so, I suspect there will need to be some policy issues addressing, you know, how we are going to care for all of these, uh, the, the aging American population. There has to be. I would vote for whatever candidate is for that because I realize the burden of caring for a loved one. Talk to me about what's next in your business world. What's up in your, in your amazing uh, Shark Tank life? Well, I started a new podcast, which is exciting for us. Uh, I'm helping entrepreneurs called Barber in Your Pocket. Um, helping entrepreneurs deal with the businesses of getting their business ahead. And they've become really my best friends that I've become their really? best friends. So we're having so much fun with it. What is your number one piece of advice for someone who wants to try something new, wants to start a new business, wants to just get out there and grab the economy right now? Get it going. Most people spend too much time getting ready. Forget about getting ready. Just go out in the street, get it going, and you'll find out what all the problems are and what your real business plan has to be. Thanks so much for sharing this very personal story and reminding us that we can try to like build our business, build our life, and still take care of our family at the same time. Of course. Wonderful. Ones, Barbara yeah. Corcoran, so nice to see you. In Arizona, old pay phones are now a popular resource for those in the healing process after losing loved ones, even if no one answers the call. Reporter Kyle Simchuk from our Phoenix affiliate 12 News has the details. There is a phone in Wickenburg that will never ring. It is a payphone that requires no payment. No amount of change will ever make it work again, but people still come to the Hasayampa River Preserve to use it, to say what they need to get off their chest, to say what they waited too long to say. It has no dial tone because it is a wind phone. When you start dialing your person's phone number, there's something about hearing the dial turn back and putting yourself in that space where you can imagine them there and you're saying what you need to say. It's really powerful. When Amy Dawson lost her daughter to a terminal illness in 2020, she made her own wind phone. I needed some way to continue our bond and some way to continue our relationship. I had to keep being her mom. She was the young woman with special needs. Her phone was very important to her. Dawson created a website to track wind phone locations. There are four in Arizona, including the one in Wickenburg, which was placed here by park supervisor Chris Matthews. The idea is the brainchild of Ataro Sasaki, a Japanese man who put a phone booth in his garden in 2010 and opened it to the public the following year after a devastating tsunami killed more than 18,000 people. Since then, wind phones have appeared in gardens, parks, and other public places. Yesterday had a beautiful story from a woman whose um, baby died at one day old. And she said, I didn't think it was going to help me because, of course, my baby didn't have a, a phone, right? But she said just being able to kind of offload those feelings, that upset and that anger and that hurt and devastation I was feeling, put those words out there without putting them on her husband. Dawson has also heard from parents who lost their children to fentanyl. They're angry at their child for trying drugs or, or for doing the drug. They're angry at the drug person that provided the drug, angry a lot of a lot of different places. And maybe it's not just one visit, but maybe it's a few phone calls. And finally, they work through those feelings by getting them out there and talking about it. Not all users are grieving the loss of a loved one. So there are a lot of people that go of loss of job, loss of a relationship. Uh, I've heard from someone that had a house foreclosed and they were angry and they just wanted to get it all out. So if you ever see a disconnected phone in the woods, know that it has a purpose. You always want to say it's not for everyone, but for who it's for, it's so powerful. Our thanks to our affiliate reporter, Kyle Simchuk, for that report. Uh, you can visit mywindphone.com to find one of these special locations near you. More to come on this hour of morning news now. Stay with us. All right, game one may still be a couple days away, but the World Series is already breaking records. The battle between the New York Yankees and Los Angeles Dodgers kicks off Friday in L.A. But good luck getting a ticket. The average price for a single ticket is just under 1500 bucks. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us now from Dodger Stadium with more. Uh, Morgan, good morning. Uh, in line for a ticket there? <laughs> uh, Christine, I got to tell you, I have personally thought about investing in, in one of these tickets, but I'm not quite there just yet. But that said, when you have a World Series that is Yankees Dodgers, plenty of people, they're throwing the ticket budget right out the window. And why not? You have two storied franchises here. And at the beginning of the season, the expectations were essentially World Series or bust. Come Friday, it's finally here. East Coast versus West Coast, Hollywood versus Broadway. Uh, and I got to tell you, these fans absolutely ready for it take two legendary teams with a decades-old rivalry massive fan bases 
and a couple generational superstars, and the 2024 World Series is fast becoming the hottest ticket in town on both coasts with sky-high expectations and prices to match. There ain't a person in the world that should be spending $1,000 to watch the Bronx Bombers get beat by the Dodgers. And yet plenty are happy to spend even more. This is the best matchup in baseball. Lifelong Yankee fan Raymond Perez had to be there for the team's first World Series since 2009. A total cost for four tickets was $9,400, um, and it'll be 2000 Three hundred and sixty each, and that money came from where? From my <laughs> from my wedding fund. He says his fiance approved the purchase, and he's not the only one digging deep to support their team. On Selva, we are on track for this to be the best World Series uh, in history with regards to total sales. StubHub says in the last 24 hours alone, ticket sales spiked 71%, already surpassing all ticket sales from last year's World Series matchup. Adding the right event and put some budgets on the back burner. We saw this last over the past year and a half or so with the Taylor Swift tour globally. These bucket list events where people are really willing to spend that uh, extra dollar to see and experience in something that's really unique. But for diehard fans, it's awfully tough to put a price tag on witnessing history. Everyone's probably going to be at the edge of their seat standing up the whole game. So uh, definitely just going to soak in that experience. And as fans get ready for the big game one on Friday, Dodger Nation is paying tribute today to one of their own, the family of Fernando Valenzuela, the beloved Dodgers pitcher, confirming he passed away yesterday at the age of 63. Valenzuela was born in Mexico, then immigrated to the United States, where his baseball career took off right here at Dodger Stadium, where he became a beloved member of the team, sparking Fernando mania back in the season of 1981, where the Dodgers went to the World Series and beat the, you guessed it, New York Yankees. Following his retirement, he remained an ambassador for both the team and the league, promoting Latino diversity, something that remains to this day. The organization paid tribute to Valenzuela with the message simply, Fernando Mania por siempre, Fernando Mania forever. Christine? That's wonderful. All right, Morgan, thank you. We know we'll see more of you in the days ahead. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.